urban squeeze. A look at the cities, the built environments around us all, specifically here on the Gold Coast. To help us with this each week, Jason Byrne from the School of Environment at Griffith University. Jace, hello. Oh, hang on, I'll give you a microphone so I can hear you. Uh, and alongside you, Jason, is one of your honours students, Kobe Lane. Hello and welcome. How are you going? Good to have you uh, on board today. We hear a lot about an obesity academic, about inactivity, um, about people just being lazy, eating badly food, all these kinds of things that happen in a city or an urban environment, busy lifestyles. But I've not heard of... I've heard of people describe cities as depressing, yeah. but not as perhaps a source of mental health issues. And that's what you wanted to talk about today, Jason and Kobe, depressogenic cities. Right, so cities that foster or cause depression, much like obesogenic cities, cities that uh, trigger obesity. So like you're saying, we know now um, beyond any doubt that living in a city is a risk marker for physical inactivity and becoming obese. So what are the stress factors here? In any given built environment, what do we know that can affect uh, mood and mental well-being, say? Right. So um, we're also finding out more recently that the same thing applies with depression and anxiety and mood. And it would seem that things like, and, and your little intro to Urban Squeeze kind of hints at this, the um, issues around noise mm. and light and heat, even being socially isolated, and we normally think of social... Despite proximity. Right, it's yeah. a real paradox, right? So we normally think of social isolation as maybe out in the boonies somewhere and out of contact, but you can be lonely in a crowd, and this is something the research is pointing at, and cities can be quite alienating, you know, where you don't know other people nearby. Um, things like traffic and congestion, uh, just even being in these kind of concrete canyons. There's a lot of skyscrapers approved recently, uh, this week on the Gold Coast, and uh, some people nervous that we might be Manhattanizing the Gold Coast. Well, what's, the, it, what's the collective of a sky? Of sky is it is it a Manhattan? A Manhattan, a Manhattan of skyscrapers? Right. Yes, so it was it was a busy planning meeting. That's for sure. Indeed, yeah. it was. So there's an effect there. We know from being in these kind of dense high-rise environments where you don't get a lot of sunshine, where maybe breezes are locked out, where you don't even have much contact with green space that can lead to heightened levels of anxiety or depression. But I'll give you some quick numbers. Um, living in cities apparently doubles your risk of schizophrenia. And they've done studies with twins to show that this is a, uh, not, not just a random occurrence. Like it's one a in a city, the, one in a right. less built environment. Yeah. Really? Really. Wow. Um, 21% more risk at risk of developing anxiety, uh, thirty nine percent more at risk of a mood disorder, um, and about forty percent at risk of developing depression from living in built environments. But we have to remember that not all built environments are the same, right? You know that when you think about a city, it's not one uniform place. Of course not. Mm. There's pockets that are beautiful, and there are pockets that are quite uh, quite horrible. So I was hoping maybe Kobe could tell us a little bit more about what researchers have been finding around some yes. of those things. Yes, and normally we just speak to Jace, but Jace has brought a friend today. <laughs> uh, Kobe Lane, studying a Bachelor of Urban and Environmental Planning. You're in an honours year, is that uh, right, Kobe? Yes, that's yeah, correct. Yeah, good. Um, now, what sort of things in cities has the research linked to higher levels of stress and anxiety specifically? Uh, so housing density. Uh, we've also found suburban design. So this can be things like walkability, which is the connectiveness of walking. Uh, amenities have been cafes, shops, how we can interact, and space, that's the spaces for interaction. Um, as Jason was mentioning, a lack of green space. Um, Since we come back to that. <laughs> we come back to green space all the time, yeah. don't we? But it's, it's funny, it's not just any green space. Uh, so if we perceive uh, from the characteristics that uh, vegetation is overgrown, it can give us uh, crime. So we want this moderate type of urban wilderness. An urban wilderness? Mm. What's an example of an urban wilderness? So when you think about a landscape that's a bit more manicured and cultivated, so we're not talking about a park that looks unkempt and overgrown and like a know, botanical a bit of a garden, risk, but yeah. like a botanical garden yeah, kind okay. of landscape. Yeah, right. yeah exactly. Um, clusters of certain social groups, this could be mothers and suburbs. Uh, housing affordability, it's a large issue, but it has other problems with mental health, anxiety, depression... 
and as I was saying, perceived crimes. So this can come from things like a broken window yeah. or graffiti on a wall. Okay, an untidy, scrappy city. A scrappy place mm-hmm. with lots of litter lying around. A place that looks unkempt and, and not looked after can be a trigger for people feeling fearful. anxious and fearful. And it's this heightened sense of fear that's been found to be the real uh, trigger or causal factor related to things like depression and anxiety. Uh, so if you wonder why certain councillors want dob in a graffiti artist type rules and websites and all that kind of thing for this very reason in part. Yeah, and we're not talking about, you know, the kinds of um, street art where you you have walls that are beautifully embellished by mm. a street artist. This is just a kind of tagging, run-down, unkempt kind of look which people can then see as a trigger for a place that may be a bit dangerous. Yeah, right, OK. Uh, 91.7 ABC Gold Coast, depressogenic cities the topic for urban squeeze this afternoon jason byrne here as normal alongside him an honors student at griffith university kobe lane is his name jace are some people more susceptible than others not everyone's going to be affected by these things in equal measure Right. So, I mean, as you know from your own circle of friends and my circle of friends, some are super chilled out and it seems like nothing you could do would ruffle their feathers and Mm. other people are more anxious and and stressed out. So, yes, there's a genetic predisposition towards anxiety and depression among some people that may not manifest unless they're in an environment where these triggers occur. Um, Other conditions, though, like a prolonged illness can lead to levels of increased depression where you're not seeming to recover from, from that long illness or living with a disability uh, can cause issues. Even things like uh, certain ethno-racial groups who may be finding that they're discriminated against in a built environment where um, they're not used to that. It might be recent immigrants and then suddenly they're facing a wall of hostility and that can lead to anxiety. Uh, And oftentimes immigrant groups are going to cities because that's where the opportunities are for jobs, right? That's where the future is. So, uh, again, that can be a trigger for some of these issues. You get a conflict there, yeah. Right. Um, diet and physical activity, those sorts of things are relevant as well. Yeah, we already mentioned that obesogenic uh, issue where we've got these levels of heightened obesity and we now know there's a link between obesity and depression and anxiety. People who are chronically obese are also more likely to develop uh, levels of depression. Um, So, again, a bit of an issue. So if we bundle all this sort of stuff together and put it in, in a Gold Coast context in a pragmatic sort of a way... How does urban planning help alleviate some of the risks associated with this? We're more aware than we ever have been of the perils of mental illness and and of looking after your mental health. Yeah. Uh, What are cities, this city specifically, doing to make sure that we're going the right way? That's a terrific question, Matt, and I'm going to do a magic hospital hand pass like (laughs) I've done to Tony a few times. Over the top. Do one to Kobe here. A little underground handball. Right, Kobe's doing his honours on this very topic. Ah. What do planners know about this and what are planners doing? Go. Uh, So the depressing factor is we don't know much about it. Um, but Hence your research, I correct, suspect. Yeah. Correct. Um, but what we do know is depression is a billion-dollar industry in Australia, to be exact, $12 billion. $12 billion. Per annum. Treatment of depression. Of mental health illnesses, so it can be anxiety, bipolar, okay. schizophrenia, uh, other mental So I'm, I'm using depression as a catch-all, but that's the wrong thing to do. Let's mental, mental health. Mental health, yeah. Mm. Uh, but we have we do have groups like Beyond Blue, uh, Headspace, that they are playing a role in trying to mitigate these problems. $12 billion. But once again, planners do have little awareness, um, hence why my research is coming in. From what I'm finding is that we need to consider the design guidelines. So this can be things like upkeep, the amount of greening that we have in our suburbs, the things I touched on, like walkability, yeah. how connected we can be, the amenity. It's, it's, it really comes down to that social interaction is what I'm finding. It's fascinating too. I mean, and we again, another touchstone for us, Jace, in the past has been public transport and connectivity with public transport. Some of the things you're talking about is just so critical. We, we, you see it as an, oh, we need this infrastructure, in terms of the geography, you've got to get from A to B somehow, and I'd prefer not to do it in a car. But there's other factors too that, right. uh, that could be saving considerable cash. $12 billion. That's a lot of How money. How do they add that up? How do you looking tally at, up the costs? Looking at health care costs, looking at the costs, the burden that's placed upon not being able to be at work, lost productivity, lost, productivity, lost hours, that kind of stuff. The yeah. costs upon carers, there's a range of different kinds of uh, measures. Yeah, yep. things to think about. huh? What about here on the Gold Coast? So that's a really great question. Um, and again, I'll sort of segue back into Kobe in a minute. The international research has found that 
things like an increased number of bottle shops or liquor stores in the community can be associated with higher levels of anxiety or depression. Now, that may be due to a perceived risk of crime, mm -hmm. or it may simply be because things like alcoholism can lead to um, chronic depression too. Um, also, issues like uh, the availability of fresh fruit and vegetables. We know that if you're eating well and you're looking after yourself, that that can be preventative. It can protect you uh, against anxiety, depression, poor mental health. But if you're stuck in a part of the city where there's lack of access to fresh fruit and veggies, you don't have a good supermarket down the road, there's no fresh fruit shops yeah, around. Well, all you've got is a servo with a fast food outlet attached right, to it, that sort of thing. Not necessarily selling the best kind of food, right? Yeah. Um, so that can predispose you to, to these kind of risks. But on the Gold Coast, Kobe, you've also been looking at what some of these issues might be, right? Exactly. So we do have poor public uh, transport and places leading to isolation. So Jason talked about that it's not... You can, you can be close together and have this social isolation, and you talked about uh, proximity. Yeah. There's another thing, accessibility. You can be close, but if you can't access it, then you are isolated. So they are... Proximity and access, accessibility are two very different things. Separate items, OK. Exactly. Um, but in, in our suburbs that are sprawled, I don't know if we've talked about this on previous um, radio shows, but urban sprawling, so the suburbs that are going kilometres and kilometres out and then you need bus networks or private car to get to it, not all of them are connected by public transport. So now you are isolated by public transportation and it could be its own accessibility and proximity. What, uh, what if planners focus on... Um, infrastructure that circumvents the need to travel? What about creating, you know, shopping hubs uh, and factoring that into to development in various parts of, say, on the Gold Coast that aren't as well access or aren't as accessible as others? And that's a terrific, uh, a, a terrific question, Matt. So when we look at the Northern Growth Corridor of the Gold Coast, we're seeing this sort of thing starting to occur. That's what we call master planning, a master plan community. So we kind of hear about the master plan. We <laughs> do, yeah. So, you know, I grew up in, in Western Australia in on, on the northern suburbs of Perth and it was a very alienating, isolating kind of childhood because we didn't have shops nearby. There were no movie theatres where you could go and catch a movie. Uh, public transport was terrible. It would take me an hour and a half to get to school on a bus, you know, this kind of stuff. It was really not a great environment to be in. Um, now planners are thinking about, well, how do we design neighbourhoods where we install this infrastructure up front? So if you look at the Coomera Town Centre, for example, up on our Northern Growth Corridor, you can see there that they're beginning to put this infrastructure in up front. You know, the shops are in place already, the local taverns in there, the, the kinds of places where you might meet are in place. Yeah. But we still have a bit of a lag with public transport, right? And that's oftentimes because there's this argument that you need the population there to justify the the expenditure of putting it well, on. Well, I, I suppose I'm focusing on approaching it perhaps from a different a different angle. In, in that, um, is there is there a cost benefit analysis that takes place in and around this? It's better to design um, satellite suburbs that are self-contained rather than invest big scale in public transport networks that are at risk and significant expense to a local government? Yeah, another great question. So you know, we were playing around with that idea in the 60s and 70s. These ideas of satellite cities were particularly common in the UK and a little bit in the US. We tried them in Australia as well. And they didn't necessarily work. And part of that was because of employment. You know, if you've got the employment opportunities still existing in the uh, central business district, not everybody can get a job in the satellite community and then everybody's on the M1, mm. then, right? Mm. So in, in some way, we need to reach a kind of what planners call a sweet spot. So just the right amount of density, not ultra-tall buildings, but eight-storey tall buildings, creating a kind of Barcelona environment where it's highly walkable, the shops and things are nearby, you've got entertainment facilities nearby, and Kobe, again, is sort of finding some of these issues, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, interesting stuff, interesting stuff. How, how long's an honours year? Though? It, well, is it a year? It's, or in, is it... it's inclusive into the degree. Uh, so I started this project about five months ago. OK. Uh, just as a separate proposal subject and I've got uh, I believe nine months to do it. Nine months how's he going Jase? He's doing pretty good. All right? We've got a deadline hurtling <laughs> towards him like an oncoming train in September but so far so good. Well I reckon if previous episodes of, of Urban Squeeze are anything to go by there's plenty to focus on here on the Gold Coast that you can perhaps apply so good on you. You've chosen wisely geographically. <laughs> uh, Jase thanks for coming in again. Thanks Matt always, always a pleasure. You. And Kobe good luck with it. Thanks for joining the, joining the show. Thank you. Kobe Lane honours student at Griffith
Griffith University alongside... Uh, are you the teacher in charge, Jase? I am. I'm the supervisor. <laughs> He's so the he supervisor. has to behave himself. The right? super <laughs> associate professor, Jason Byrne, urban planner, uh, School of Environment at Griffith University.